So how much risk would it really be for Nintendo to launch their next system this year as opposed to waiting? Last week I put out a video which got a fair bit of traction on a major potential reason why Nintendo might want to hold its horses on releasing their next system, which I'll call Switch 2 only for ease of naming, and why this may account for the rumoured, emphasis on rumoured, internal delay. This video is to respond to some of the comments, develop some points, moderate my view on one thing and generally add a bit more depth. My original video is linked at the top, so if you haven't seen that, I suggest you go and watch it to get the full context of this one. However, for a fast food summary, my view is that the yen is currently weak, but likely to strengthen within the next 12 months, and this creates multiple difficulties for Nintendo. Now, one comment I've commonly seen is, would Nintendo not use hedging and other strategies to minimise their exposure to the turbulence of the exchange rate market? And of course, the answer is yes, they would, and demonstrably do, as a look through their annual reports does show. However, it's worth noting that in the company's lists of risks every year, they still identify currency risk as the number one threat to the business and have done for years. They state, Nintendo distributes its products globally, with overseas sales accounting for more than 70% of its total sales and the majority of monetary transactions are made in local currencies. In addition, the company holds a substantial amount of assets in foreign currencies. Fluctuations in foreign exchange rates have a strong influence, not only when accounts in foreign currencies are converted to yen-denominated assets, but also when they are re-evaluated for financial reporting purposes. Therefore, if there are significant fluctuations in foreign exchange rates, Nintendo's financial position, operating results, and cash flows could be adversely affected. In order to reduce the influence of fluctuations in foreign exchange rates, Nintendo purchases in foreign currencies on an ongoing basis. So yes, of course, hedging is a vital part of their strategy to minimize financial losses, but another good way of avoiding financial losses is to exert a good deal of caution in the first place. There's a precedent for Nintendo having problems with the yen at product launches despite hedging activities which we'll address in a second. But first, let's take a moment to consider the scale of the endeavour of launching a brand new console. Yes, Nintendo is a wealthy company with huge reserves, but even for them, manufacturing a new major console in an uncertain market with potential risks around chip supply is a huge deal. As a working assumption that uses round figures, let's say that Nintendo at some point really did consider launching in September 2024 and wanted to have 10 million consoles for the launch window. Obviously, I don't mean 10 million sitting on a shelf, but given the time it takes to get all the constituent parts together and assembled, several million could be at various stages along the production process by the time of launch. 10 million is slightly less than the number of Switches sold in the 2020 holiday quarter, and while it's certainly a very high number, a fair bit higher than the 4.5 million PlayStation 5 sold in that console's first quarter, given the popularity of the Switch and the hype around the sequel console, and the fact that it's likely to be more affordable in price than the PS5, if Nintendo wants to make an aggressive start into the next generation, I don't think it's completely impossible as a sales target for the last four months of the year, especially if the launch lineup was incredibly strong. Besides, if it's possible to build to producing at a huge scale, then doing so is usually more profitable, and since Nintendo will be confident that they will sell all these systems in the medium term at least, I don't see them wanting to soft step in the launch. Furthermore, let's assume that the new console has roughly the same margins as the original Switch in 2017. Then, the Japanese teardown company Formal Hout Techno Solutions estimated a build cost of $257 per console, meaning a little over 85% of the cost of the system was eaten up just in manufacture. Of course, the margins could be quite different today, but let's use that switch information as a starting point for an estimate. If we assume one more thing, that they will price the system at $399, the equivalent proportionate cost, i.e. 85%, would be about $343 per system to manufacture. Multiply that by 10 million systems and you're talking about an outlay of $3.4 billion. That's more than a quarter of the company's entire annual turnover. And that's before you talk advertising, storage, transport, security, and more. If you're an innately cautious, consensual Japanese company, this is not a small outlay to commit to. Heck, for any business, that's a huge choice to make. What about from the sales side? One correction I should make to the original video is that there is precedent for Nintendo selling games at a loss. In fact, there's an example in relatively recent memory that might engender even more caution among the members of the Nintendo board. Both the 3DS, following its price drop, and the Wii U were initially sold 
resolved at a loss. In October 2012, Satoru Iwata explained the situation with both consoles, and his statement is worth examining closely as evidently Nintendo will be looking back on this experience as they plan their next move. He said, During the second quarter of this fiscal term, we have successfully eliminated the situation that we sell the Nintendo 3DS hardware below cost, which was the main reason our corporate profits fell in the last term. However, as we are in the phase of concentrating our development resources on software for the Nintendo 3DS system, which is still in an earlier stage of penetration than that of the Nintendo DS, and we have not yet launched the Wii U system, it is difficult to increase the total sales of software, which is generally profitable. In addition to the Yen's continuous appreciation, the Wii U hardware will have a negative impact on Nintendo's profits early after the launch, because rather than determining a price based on its manufacturing cost, we selected one that consumers would consider to be reasonable. In this first half of the term before the launch of Wii U, we were not able to make a profit on software for the system, while we had to book a loss on the hardware, which is currently in production and will be sold below cost. Our loss has therefore widened during the second quarter in spite of bringing the Nintendo 3DS hardware back to profitability. Although we expect our financial performance to be revitalized under these circumstances, unfortunately, we cannot say that we will achieve Nintendo-like profits within this fiscal year. A few things to unpick in this. Firstly, and most obviously, this was another example of the strengthening yen causing a headache for the company. But I'm more interested that, in many ways, their strategy with the Wii U was the relatively un-Nintendo-like approach of using the machine as a loss leader for their games. My baseline assumption was that they would not want to sell their hardware at a loss, but what if this assumption is wrong? Could they do the same again that they did with the Wii U? Although it seems unlikely that Nintendo would voluntarily slash their profits on a major console, and unlikelier still that they would look to emulate the launch of a notorious financial flop like the Wii U, there are still reasons they might believe that doing so will be prudent, from the cost of chips, rendering the parts more expensive, to the need to make the system a mass market proposition, especially at a time of economic uncertainty. They were confident that their games lineup in 2012 would cover them, and that confidence was probably unfounded. Granted, new Super Mario Bros. U sold relatively well for Wii U and ended up as its third biggest selling title, with Nintendo Land as the fourth biggest selling title, but there wasn't really a deep bench of Wii U games for the first year. But there's still every reason to think the lineup will be a lot healthier for the first year of the new system as they try to repeat the Switch formula of having a consistent pace of heavy hitting titles across the first calendar year. In particular, looking at the stratospheric sales of Mario Kart 8 Deluxe, they might assume that having a new Mario Kart game at launch would spark similarly titanic and equally long-lived sales. If it were priced at $70 and had the potential for further sales still through DLC later in the console life and the potential to push people into the online service, the idea of having having the console as a loss leader might seem a lot less risky. But a final risk that Nintendo faces, of course, is that if they do nothing, there is the possibility that the current Switch loses all momentum Wii style. While this does remain a risk, Nintendo has shown that they can rebound very effectively from a relatively dormant period as long as they get the rebound right. To give a much smaller scale example, in 2018 they had a very weak lineup for the first nine months. If you take out the remakes and ports, they just had Kirby Star Allies, Mario Tennis Aces and Nintendo Labo to represent original first party games for the first nine months of the year. Then they bounced back in the holiday quarter with Super Mario Party, Pokemon Let's Go and of course Super Smash Bros. Ultimate. We also saw similar resilience with 3DS which did have a faltering launch but ended up still being a reasonably successful system for the company. Plus, the Switch's decline hasn't, so far at least, been anything like as precipitous as the Wii, which was wasn't even selling a million a quarter through the first nine months of 2012, and Nintendo does have options to stimulate demand further by reviewing its pricing. However, one thing I think I'd like to row back on a little bit from the last video is the likelihood of a price cut, at least not a formal price cut like Nintendo selects as opposed to a slightly higher cadence of one-off game sales, or bundling extra games in with the console while keeping it at the same sticker price. As numerous people wisely pointed out in the comments to my previous video, Nintendo have reached a stage where their games are associated with a level of value, and so, while in some respects, turbocharging sales of their outgoing system makes sense, if the next console is backwards compatible, they could, 
be shooting themselves in the foot by lowering the price particularly of the games right now. However, I'm planning to return to explore the problems and opportunities offered by backwards compatibility another time. Certainly though, Nintendo won't need to cut the price of its console to make a healthy profit as even the less profitable OLED model must by now be cheaper to produce than it was and this could represent a good chance to burn off old stock while using the strong yen as cover for the relatively weak sales numbers. For this reason, my current thinking is that any kind of formal selects line or formal cut to the price of the Switch is no more than a 30% chance and possibly even less than that. Just a quick note at the end to say a massive thank you to the many people who've subscribed over the last week or so and for the kind comments, helpful feedback and suggestions for topics to explore in future. I've tried to take it all on board. Also, although I've done a lot of Switch 2 videos recently, for those who've enjoyed my channel for other reasons, I have more deep dives planned for different developers and some more analytical videos on what some recent games show about Nintendo's changing game design philosophy. In the meantime though, please check out these videos on the screen at the moment and have a terrific day.